And don't, don't forget what we're trying to do. Keep, keep the big picture in mind. We're trying to give you uh, tools to help you to read more carefully, to read more deeply, to get more out of the Word of God, and to read it more accurately. But also don't forget uh, chapter two, that we are on this interpretive journey. Uh, and these things that we're doing here in chapters three, four, and five, the chapters that are stressing observation and how to read, this is all part of that first step of the journey of grasping the text in their town, asking what did it mean uh, for them. So at this point, remember, we're trying to see, we're trying to observe. Uh, it will be in the later steps that we start asking about meaning and asking about application. Those are important steps, but at the beginning, Beginning here, we're still just trying to observe. Uh, don't forget what we did in the last chapter as well. In chapter three, we looked at things to look for in the smallest unit, in sentences, and uh, we looked at repetition and contrast, comparisons, list, cause and effect, figures of speech, conjunctions. We did verbs, we did pronouns. Those things are not going away as we move to larger units of text. So as we move from sentences to paragraphs, we want to continue to use those same tools, look for those same kinds of things like repetition, even when you're dealing with a larger chunk of text. But as we move from uh, sentences to paragraphs, there are some other things, some specific things uh, that we want to add to your repertoire of literary devices, things that you're looking for in the text. So let's start with these. Number one, uh, first thing we want to learn to look for is the movement from general to specific. For example, if I'm talking to you and I say, well, I like dessert, and then I say, I like apple pie, I like strawberry shortcake, I like chocolate chip cookies. Notice that what I've done is start with a general statement and then move to a series of specific statements that expand on and expound on that first opening general statement. Uh, the biblical text does this frequently. Uh, for example, look at Romans 12:1. Uh, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Well, this is the opening general statement. It's broad. There's no specifics here. There's a call on us uh, to offer our bodies, you know, as a living sacrifice to God. The specifics come a little later down to chapter uh, 9 to 12. Here, then, we get a very specific list of things to do. Love must be sincere. Hate what's evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord. Be joyful, patient, faithful in prayer. So we went from a general statement in verse 1 to specific statements of what to do uh, down in 9 to 12. Now, of course, you can do this in reverse. You can also say, I like strawberry shortcake. I like... Uh, I like apple pie. I like chocolate chip cookies. In fact, I like all dessert. And in that sense, you've done a series of specifics followed by the general statement at the end. And in that sense, the general statement functions, you know, kind of as a concluding summary. So number one was general and specific. Number two, uh, questions and answers. Uh, any, anytime you're in a text and you're reading and somebody asks a question, uh, you want to flag that. Flag that question mark and then look and see uh, where the answer is and make sure that you see the direct correlation between the question and the answer. Uh, for example, in the early chapters of Mark, uh, the Pharisees come to Jesus. We have a confrontation here, and they ask him, uh, who can forgive sin but God alone? And then Jesus responds back, uh, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, this is the one, remember, they brought him through the roof and the, uh, through the hole in the roof. So he said to the man, I tell you, uh, get up, take your mat and go home. So Jesus answers their question uh, first by telling them that he has authority and then by showing them that he has authority by healing this man and telling this man to get up and walk. Uh, but it's a little more complex than this. And the question and answer, noticing the question and answer sequence, uh, pulls together this whole unit. Mark 2, 1 to 3, 6 is united together. In fact, the whole unit moves uh, because of these series of questions and answers. Uh, and so these opponents of Jesus, the, uh, largely the Pharisees, will come and ask these first four questions. They ask him, who can forgive sins but God alone in verse 7? Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Verse 16. How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? In verse 18. And why are they doing what is lawful on, unlawful on the Sabbath? In verse 24. 
But notice there's a difference in when they go from verse 4 to verse 5 because the Pharisees ask the first four questions and Jesus asked the fifth question. Uh, each of those questions that they ask Jesus, of course, is answered in the verses that follow. So they ask a question, Jesus gives an answer. They ask a question, number two, Jesus gives the answer. They ask number three, he gives the answer. Number four, they ask, he gives the answer. Five, Jesus asks this question. What's lawful to do on the Sabbath, to do good or to do uh, evil, to save life or to kill? And the response to that is in 3.6, they then plot to kill Jesus. So that's their response in illustrating that they are indeed doing evil here on the Sabbath. The other interesting thing about these five questions, four by Jesus' opponent and one by Jesus, is it's paralleled again at the end of Mark. So Mark opens with a series of five questions, four by Jesus' opponent, one by him, and it ends the same way. At the end of Jesus' ministry, he's in the temple, he's confronted by the Pharisees and Sadducees, they fire these four questions at him, similar questions. He responds back with a question at the end. And of course, this time they don't plot to kill him, but they actually crucify our Lord. So questions and answer becomes an important thing to identify. Uh, number three is similar, uh, the issue of dialogue. Uh, questions and answers are kind of a subset uh, of dialogue, but dialogue is broader than that. Uh, anytime you have a dialogue, if, uh, if, if people are talking in the biblical text, you want to identify uh, what's going on, what's the setting. Not, not only who is speaking, but who is listening. Who is it addressed to? He may be talking directly to one person answering their question, but are there other people in the room when Jesus talks to the Pharisees, is he really, is his message for the Pharisees or is his message for other people around them? Uh, I like to try and visualize it like I'm filming a movie. How am I going to set up the characters? Who else is in the room or in the, uh, in the setting? Who can hear what's being said uh, when you have this dialogue taking place? Uh, think of all the famous uh, 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 dialogues uh, uh, that you know of uh, throughout the Bible. You have Jesus and the woman at the well uh, talking there. You have that conversation. Uh, and John 13, remember Jesus and Peter have this interesting conversation about uh, who's going to wash his feet. Is Peter going to wash him? Will Jesus wash his feet? Uh, Exodus 3, wow, there's a conversation with God himself where Moses encounters God on the burning bush and you have this dialogue between Moses and God. So when you have those conversations, those dialogues, identify them, what's the setting, what takes place. Sometimes they're a little more complicated. In fact, in Habakkuk, uh, in the opening chapters of Habakkuk, there's actually a series, there's a dialogue here, and this one is easily missed. Uh, the Habakkuk opens in the opening verses, and he cries out, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? And he goes on and on. The law is paralyzed. Justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. So in the opening verses, Habakkuk cries out, why is there all this injustice? And why don't you do something about it, God? So he makes this cry. Well, somewhat surprisingly, if we read on, God answers. And so he's Habakkuk's made this opening cry. Now God comes in verse 5, and from 5 to 11, there's an answer. God says, look at the nations and watch. Be utterly amazed. I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told, I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people. They deride kings. They scoff at rulers. They sweep past them like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own strength is their God. So Habakkuk, God answers back to Habakkuk and says, I am doing something. I'm raising up the Babylonians. Well, then Habakkuk responds back in the next couple of verses. And he says, you know, that's not quite what I had in mind. The Babylonians are worse than we are. Uh, and uh, so he kind of questions God. And then God answers him in the following verses and says, nonetheless, this is what's going to happen, and you are to wait for it. So the whole book of Habakkuk, it's difficult to figure out what's going on until you recognize that it's a dialogue. There's a series of exchanges. Habakkuk speaks, God speaks, Habakkuk speaks, God speaks. Uh, there's no setting like we have in the narratives. There's no room or uh, seaside, or there's no audience. There's just God and Habakkuk, but it is nonetheless a dialogue, very important to identify, to understand the book of Habakkuk. 
Number four, another thing to look for, purpose and result statements. Anytime you have a text that it gives you the idea of a purpose or a result, sometimes it will say so that or in order that or for the purpose of, then you want to mark this down, identify the purpose statement. Uh, Ephesians 2.10 is a good example of for where God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And so there's a purpose. Why have we been created in Christ Jesus? That's this purpose uh, that's stated here uh, for us to do good works. Another good text uh, from the Old Testament here, Israel, be careful to obey. And then here's the purpose, so that it may go well with you and so that or that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey. So as you come across these purpose and result statements, mark them right down. Here's a purpose statement. God's telling us to do something, and he's giving us a specific purpose for why uh, we are doing that. These kind of identifications are going to help us when we move along our interpretive journey from step one over into step three. We start trying to draw principles. Uh, being able to identify these purpose statements will help us as we, as we move into that step. Uh, related to the purpose statements is the issue of, of a means. Uh, why, uh, wh what are the means by which God is bringing something about in our life? So we're looking for this issue of means. Here's a good example, Psalm 119.9. Uh, how can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to your word? So he's given us a means. How does one stay pure? How does one live in a righteous and pure way? Well, by, by, by being faithful to God's word, by living according to the word of God, and that's the means. Uh, so when you see these issues of means, then identify them, mark them. Here's a means that the Bible's giving us. Number six is, is conditional clauses, and a conditional clause is simply an if uh, type of clause. Sometimes it will say if, and then they'll have then, and they'll very clearly give you the other half. If this happens, then that happens. Sometimes they don't put the word then there, but nonetheless, they are giving you a consequence. If this happens, then there's a consequence. Uh, so always identify these conditional clauses and, uh, and uh, look and see what's the if side and what is the then side uh, of the text. Uh, here in 1 John 1, 6, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, all of that is the if side. If we claim one thing, yet we live this way, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, the then, the consequence, the other half, we lie, and we do not live out the truth. So you have an if statement, and then you have this then, whether the then stated or not, you have the consequences, the other side of the conditional clause. Another good example in 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, he says, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. So you have this if and then, if you're in Christ, there's a then, then the new creation has come. So you have this conditional clause uh, and this tight connection between being in Christ and the fact that you are now a new creation. So pay attention, watch conditional clauses. They can be tricky, uh, but they're helpful for unlocking the text for us and seeing what the biblical authors have said. Number seven is the actions and roles of people and the actions and roles of God. Anytime you're in a text, back up and ask yourself, what is it that God is doing? What's God's role in this passage? What are the things that God does? And then back up and also say, well, then what are the things that people do? So what are the roles of people, the actions of people in the text? What are the roles and actions of God in the text? Uh, and then also, you know, look and see what are they giving names to God? Are they, they are describing these roles in, the, in, the, in a sense of a term? Are they calling God the king? Are they calling God father? These kinds of things are helping to define uh, what his role is in the text. Uh, Ephesians 5, 1 to 2 is a good example. Uh, it says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So we're asking, what is Christ's role? What did Jesus do here? Well, he loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering. So what should we do? Well, we are children of God, and we should live the same way. We should walk in the same way uh, as Jesus did and, and model after Jesus, and that's our role, to be like him and to walk in the way of love in the same way that Jesus did. So identify the roles of uh, God, identify the roles of people. Another very interesting passage over in, in Matthew, we have a long passage, 543 to 634, where there are 14 references to God as Father, 
Episode after episode after episode repeats father, 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 father. So of course you remember word repetition from our last chapter, we mark all of those. But then we have to start asking, what's the point? This is God they're talking about. So when they hit mention father, 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 father repeatedly, then we wanna back up what's the role of God throughout that entire section, throughout that chapter. It's that God is like the father and the text is stressing that. So we wanna identify that. Is God presented as a father? Is he presented as the husband? Is he presented as the king? Is he presented as the shepherd? What is the role that's being played, uh, played out by God presented in that text? So the roles, the actions of people, and the roles, the actions of God. Number eight, e emotional terms. And I think sometimes we tend to skip over this. Uh, often I think we become a little bit too detached. We become a little bit thinking that reading the Bible, uh, that the Bible is just uh, uh, a non-emotional, you know, like a computer, it's detached, it's just a, like an essay uh, that's, that's, that, that's neutral and it's feeling, and then nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, the Bible is an emotionally charged book. It's about relationships between us and God, uh, and there's all kinds of emotion in it, and we, we would argue that emotion's part of the meaning of the text. It's not something we add on, it's not secondary, it's rooted down in the meaning, and you can look for terms that express that. Uh, look at what Paul says here in, uh, in Galatians 4 and the terms that he uses. And so what you would be doing is noting, circling, marking text of, uh, terms and verbs in the text that seem to have some kind of emotional connotations. Paul says, I plead with you uh, in this pleading idea. Brothers and sisters, he calls them. It's a very intimate term. Uh, Become like me, for I became like you. He said, you did me no wrong. And then he reminds them of, of what happens when he first met them. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ himself. He remembers that when he was, he was sick when he first came to them, but they cared for them. They had compassion on them. Now, in contrast, he's hurt. He goes on, where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify if you could have done so. You would have torn out your eyes. And what a powerful emotional term. He said, you loved me so much. You cared for me so much when I first came. You would have even pulled your eyes out and given them to me. And Paul says, then have I now become your enemy by telling the truth to you? So Paul is hurt here, and he's pouring out his heart and reminding the Galatians of how they cared for him in the past. Why then, as he said, are you opposed to me now and not listening to these things that I'm trying to teach you? Uh, related to emotional terms then, number nine is this issue of tone. And of course, emotion is part of the tone, but anytime you're in, the, uh, you're in a biblical text, you, you want to ask, what is, what is the tone? Because tone varies quite a bit as you move through the, as you move through the text. Uh, 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 tone is a, uh, 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 you can have Paul explaining things in Romans, and it's a very neutral, very essay, kind of detached, a very neutral type tone. Or sometimes you'll have God pouring out his heart. Israel has abandoned him, gone after other gods. And it, like a husband who's been jilted, uh, God pours out, his, pours out his heart. So tone becomes a very, very important, uh, uh, an important aspect. Uh, you get a big comparison of tone when you look at Colossians 3, 1 to 4. Paul's explaining things. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. It's very explanatory. If you compare that with Galatians 3, where Paul says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was portrayed as crucified. And so the tone of those two passages, even written by Paul, is very, very different. And if you don't catch the tone, the shift in tone, then you're missing missing something of the meaning and something of the intention of the author there. So as you read through your text, back up and ask, what's the tone of this paragraph? Is it angry? Is it just explanatory? Is it emotional? Is it hurt? What's the basic tone of the text? Uh, note in Lamentations, a great illustration at the, in Lamentations 3, where he says, I am the man who's seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He's driven me away. He's made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he's turned his hand against me again and again all day long. And you have this tone of just despair. 
uh, and, uh, and 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 doom, and and the the, the the author is despairing over what's happened. The judge Jerusalem's been destroyed, uh, and so it's a lament, it's a cry, it's like the blues. He's it's a it's a sad sad uh, uh, tone that is set throughout the book of Lamentations. And if you miss that, and you don't see the difference between that and say a psalm of praise, uh, then then we're missing some of the meaning of the text. So again, now that we've identified some additional things, added on to what we learned in the last chapter, we moved to paragraphs. Now we've added some things to look for here in this last chapter. Uh, do you want to be able to add that into uh, uh, analysis of the text? So now pull up your text, pull up your passage, start working through what are the roles of God? What are the roles of people? What's the tone here? Is there a dialogue here? Are there questions and answers uh, 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 here? And are there emotional uh, terms that are being used here? Write all those in your text as you're writing. Don't forget the earlier ones, repetition, cause and effect, list, those types of things. So now you're building your repertoire of things that you can look for. You're building your list of literary devices. So when you come to a text, what am I doing now at the observation stage? Well, I'm looking for all of these things. Now, this list we've given you is not exhaustive. There are other things. There's details now that you've seen the kinds of things that we're looking for. We want you to be looking deeper into the text, looking for these details, marking them with your pencil, trying to see, writing out on the margins uh, and probing, rereading, reading the text, marking it, setting it aside, praying about it, going back into the text, marking it again, reading again, exploring again, trying again, asking questions, writing in the margins margins, repeating this over and over, and this will get you deeper and deeper into the text, help you in this observation stage, and really prepare you then to start asking that question, what does this text mean? What did it mean to them? What did it mean to the original audience? And then across the interpretive bridge, we're going to be asking the question then as we get on into step five, what does it mean to us?